Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This is Doug Brunke with Global Chamber. We have a really exciting uh, and interesting and informative conversation we're about to have with three extraordinary uh, experts on marketing and product leadership. The actual title of our event today is Define, Enable, and Deliver Global Content Effectiveness in Marketing and Product Leadership, which is a mouthful, we undoubtedly agree, uh, but you're gonna kind of get a head full of information today from our experts, the first of whom will be Esther Curiel, who is a localization operations manager at Indeed. She, I believe, is calling in from her home in Dublin, Ireland today, uh, where it's not hot, as I understand it. Uh, she helps brands achieve international growth objectives by integrating assets, developments, and value from the content marketing and UX worlds into localization and globalization processes. So as uh, many of us in the global tribe are involved with, we're working across borders and across metro areas. And so uh, Esther, thank you so much today for joining us. And we look forward to hearing your information. My pleasure. Thank you, Doug. Well, why, why don't you kick things off? You've got your presentation and uh, thank you again. Excellent. Thank you very much for, for having me here, first of all. I'm absolutely delighted to be talking to your audience today about uh, global content effectiveness. Um, this is a topic that I'm, I'm very, very passionate about. I've been working on it for the last uh, 20 years. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving this opportunity. Um, and I think the, the topic itself is becoming more and more relevant, you know, international expansion, um, obviously, the, the barrier to entry for international has been getting lower and lower. But also one thing I've seen is that uh, more and more companies are starting to see their, their growth in their domestic markets plateauing. So what I see is that more and more of them are becoming kind of forced to look uh, overseas in order to fulfill their, their growth objectives. Um, and one theme that I've seen um, is that often when they get to that stage, um, there's an awful lot of, um, I suppose there were processes and structures that were created without international in mind. And this can create an awful lot of pain um, and an awful lot of poor customer experiences and so on. And all of these, a lot of these can be avoided. So that's what I'd like to focus the, my presentation today on. Kind of the, I suppose, the two main areas that I, I have observed throughout my career that can really introduce a lot of pain. So it's worth tackling them early on. Uh, and then towards the end of the presentation, I'll be going into some practical ways to go beyond that and really go for true effectiveness and then the way to delight your customers internationally in the same way as you would uh, domestically. Okay, so the, the first main area is um, making sure that there is a global mindset across your organization, that it really permeates the organization. And this is something that might seem extremely basic, and yet I think it's worth calling out because I, I, I've seen it being a problem um, across many, many companies, regardless of the size, large and small alike. Um, this is really at the cause of an awful lot of, uh, of trouble, of heartache, and again, poor customer experience. Um, and um, when I'm saying this, what I mean is uh, you might have seen yourself, you know, you might have looked at a website. Uh, if, uh, if you're not English speaking yourselves, you might have noticed uh, perhaps a, a website with English text in it. Or perhaps you've been the recipient of a form that contained fields that, that were totally not relevant for your market. Some of them might even be felt as um, almost dirty on, on insulting even, you know, they, they might be requesting information that you would rather not give um, stuff on ethnicity, for instance, is something that sometimes bothers me when I get these forms. So stuff like that, it's, it's little things, but they do make, make a difference and they really um, make the, uh, the international customer disengage really. Um, now, um, they really, this really can give international customers a kind of a second class experience. And uh, this has been the issue like ever since we started expanding internationally, but it hadn't been so much of a problem. There were very few companies going international. That's changing now. There's also a lot of local competition that wasn't there before. 
So, uh, and the expectations from the customers themselves are changing as well. They, they, they demand better personalization. So it really is worth tackling this um, and, and doing so can give you a competitive advantage as well. So it, it's worth getting this right, really. And now, um, this is something that is easier said than done. Uh, make sure your organization has a global mindset. Um, how do you do that? So there, there's three main areas, I think, that uh, can help you get there. The first one is obviously awareness. Um, you need to make sure that anyone who is involved in the content production, um, the content creation or production chain, is aware of the things that can go wrong. Uh, so again, uh, you know, going back to that example of the website that has English in it, maybe the developers hard-coded strings. They shouldn't have done that, but they didn't know otherwise. So people need to be aware at the different stages in which they interact with the content that is going to be localized or translated into the, the different uh, languages. Um, making them aware is the first step, but it's not enough. You also need to train them. You, you need to give them the tools to actually do something about it. So you might want to look at giving your developers internationalization training and documenting it so that as people leave the organization, new ones come in, that knowledge is not lost. And this really, I've seen this being a problem in so many organizations that I really feel it needs to be called out. Um, and then finally, accountability. And this is often missing as well. Um, so you might have the training, you might have the awareness, but no one is really making sure that this happens. Like everyone is very busy, unless international is built into the objectives and the goals of the different teams you know, who have anything to do with your content, it's just not gonna happen or it's not gonna happen consistently. So it's important to have that accountability. It's important for this, for, for this global mindset, this awareness to be coming from the top down as well, to have the executive, the leadership uh, support. And again, this very often fails. So we can go on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so global mindset was the first kind of big rock, if, if you like, you know, big area that uh, needs to be um, got right, if you like. The second one would be process for me. And again, I've seen this being a, a problem very often. Um, um, organizations very often have developed processes over time and they've developed um, shortcuts and bad practices and just ways to get things done quickly that might not be following best process. And that's okay when you're small uh, and when you're only dealing with one or two markets. As you keep growing, this be can become really, I'm not gonna say unmanageable because organizations do manage it, but it becomes more and more of a problem. And as you start expanding into six, seven, um, 10, 20 languages, this can really add an awful lot of pain. So it really does pay to look at your processes um, early on and try and streamline them before you decide to grow further. Uh, we're gonna go on to the next, uh, the next slide. So, um, again, any, any processes, again, that are related to your content production, um, a content organization chain will need to be looked at. Um, I've given you a few examples here. So for example, tech integration. So you, you might have a technology stack and perhaps, perhaps you don't even know how many different tools are being used across the organization. Uh, you might be thinking of um, getting new tools for your, perhaps for your marketing automation software um, and you're not sure which ones to get. It really does pay to pay to, it pays to think about international at that stage and make sure that whatever technology you're using is going to integrate well with your uh, translation um, management systems. So again, you haven't expanded yet. Um, it's good to understand what technology you're using across the organization and there can be a lot of silos so sometimes you don't have the whole picture. Get it, find out what technology you're using and when you start talking to your vendors or, or if you start thinking about purchasing the, the translation management technology yourself, make sure that uh, it will actually integrate well with, um, with your existing tool set. Um, I've seen very severe cases where even the tech stack that the organization was using didn't make sense. Like there were different tools being used for the same thing by different teams. Um, like, 
perhaps uh, even website repositories being in different places, housed in different tools. So if you can streamline all that before you grow any further. Um, another thing is that you often have different teams creating content. So you might have your product teams, your developers creating some, you know, perhaps the, uh, your apps or your website and so on. You, you'll have uh, sales and marketing teams creating content as well, even sub teams within those. Um, and you can end up with very um, inconsistent content that from the point of view of the customer will be giving them a very disjointed experience. So again, this is, this is more of a content, um, uh, you know, it's good housekeeping. It's not necessarily for international, but if you don't have this right at international, again, it's gonna become a bigger and bigger problem as you expand. So if you don't have it right for your domestic content. So you want to make sure you have things like um, uh, your corporate terminology approved and understood and, and um, the different teams that have to create content understand uh, where your comp the corporate terminology lives and what the approval process is. And everyone who needs to approve knows about it as well. Uh, terminology is one very important area. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, everyone conveys the same message in the same tone and th that you're projecting a, a coherent brand strategy. So again, having brand guidelines uh, is very important. All of these, of course, once you go international, you need similar assets for your local markets. So it's very important to have approved terminology that everyone internally, who's gonna interact with your content, your salespeople or your marketing people, they, they fit it and they're happy with it. And this is gonna help you get much better translation quality later on. So having those assets really does, does make a difference. Um, good content management practices as well, because again, um, sometimes you have uh, um, content living in different repositories. Sometimes part of that content might not even be live anymore. You might have deprecated it, but no one knows about it. It's not clear to anyone looking at those repositories what's live, what is not. Uh, and this can be a big problem um, when it comes to implementing global changes. So say you're going through a rebranding exercise and you've already translated 10 languages. So you want to change your brand name or whatever it is, or, or perhaps even the, um, the tone that you're using, you want to change that across your materials. If you don't even know where they live, if you don't know whether they're active or not, you're gonna end up either not making the changes across the board because you can't capture everything, uh, or just spending additional time and effort and money and, and budget um, making changes to material that was long ago deprecated. It's not going to be used or reused. Um, and then finally, I mean, there's, there's many more areas than this, but I've tried to capture the main ones that I, I see creating problems over and over again uh, in my experience. So localization would be another one that uh, larger organizations tend to have a localization department internally. Smaller, smaller organizations might not have that luxury but I think it really pays to have someone um, with experience in localization. Um, if, if you're going to be expanding internationally, you really need to have that expertise. Um, localization is way more complex than just outsourcing a few files for translation to a vendor, and of course, getting them translated internally or anything like that. There's a lot of automation, there's a lot of tools, and there's a lot of, um, there's so much stuff that can go wrong if you don't foresee and if you don't understand where the, the pitfalls are, that it really, like this, this is one piece of advice, if you haven't considered it, get someone internally who has at least dealt with localization before. Okay, so those were the, the main two areas that uh, I really would advise everyone to pay a lot of attention to before uh, embarking on, on international growth, or if you have already, try and get those sorted if they're not working well before you, you expand further. Um, the third, third area is, um, uh, is really how to go beyond that. So those, those two areas will give you a very, very solid foundation for deploying content internationally um, faster, with better quality, and with a lot less effort, and um, even uh, investment in the terms of resources and budget needed. So how do you go beyond that and once that you have the, the basics right? Uh, and how do you make sure that you're giving your international customers the same experience 
that your domestic customers have. Um, and we can go on to the next slide. Um, I mean, for, for me, this really, um, like how to get the cultural effectiveness and the, the content effectiveness, it really uh, a, an interaction, I suppose, between uh, your organization's um, business goals and uh, your strategy, the budget and the resources that you have, and then the uh, customer experience, really, like having a, a customer-centric approach. And what does that mean, a customer-centric approach? What do you need to look at? Um, you've probably done out of research into what your customer personas are and what your, what your customers need, what their pain points are for the, uh, look, uh, for the domestic market. Um, so it's, it's a matter of bringing that to the international markets. But budgets are not limitless. So what do you want to look at? Because you're not going to be able to put the same level of effort and uh, budget into it. Um, so I find that a good way to look at this and start deciding where the right balance is, is to look at these metrics of, um, on the one hand, you have your, your cultural traits that uh, uh, apply pretty much to every uh, nation or culture. And these are very generic. They're not just about your specific customers. They're more like national traits. Um, and a good starting point for these is uh, some research that uh, a Dutch anthropologist called uh, Hofstede. Um, he, he worked with IBM for a number of years and uh, he did very extensive research with them. And he came up with uh, six cultural dimensions in which you can pretty much um, you can pretty much put any culture, you know, against the, uh, measure it against those six different dimensions. And you can see the differences. Certain cultures might have um, perhaps a, a higher proclivity for avoiding risk or uncertainty. So this is the case, for instance, uh, Germany might, might have a much higher proclivity to avoid um, uh, to avoid risk than say the UK or the US. And what do you do with that? Like um, that's for instance, if, if Germany is one of your main markets, you might decide that you're going to adapt your materials a little bit to kind of uh, try and give them the extra, give your customers the extra peace of mind that you're already looking after the things that they feel might go wrong. Um, um, or for instance, um, um, the aesthetic sense in different uh, cultures can be different as well. So for instance, um, one that applies to localization can be um, Asian websites. They often, to, to a European eye or a Western eye, they, they look incredibly cluttered. They look ugly, they look terrible. Um, they're perfectly fine. That's the way they do it in, in Asia. Uh, whereas in Europe and the Western world, we've been moving towards clear and uh, simpler designs over time. So if, uh, if Japan, for instance, is one of your main markets, you might want to put some extra budget against uh, designing a different uh, website for this market. So those are kind of the, the generic um, national traits, if you like. And then, of course, you have your customer-specific or market-specific market, market specific factors. So you have things like um, your brand awareness, um, is going to be different in your local markets, in your international markets. So in, in your own market, you might be speaking from a position of authority. So the way, you, the way you talk to your customers is different and the level of information you need to give them about yourself is lower. If you're operating in a market where your brand awareness is very, very low, you're going to need to create a lot, of, a lot more material uh, for the kind of the that stage of the funnel, you know, the, the top stage of the funnel where the clients are still not aware that you're there. So you might want to have additional material. You might also want to tweak what you have already to, you know, to kind of uh, adjust your tone to that reality. Um, now these two items, again, each country and each market is going to be different, but you are going to find clusters of commonality. So, it's a good idea, uh, perhaps, if, if some of these markets are very important for you and they'll really um, impact your growth objectives, you might want to even write uh, two copies, one for the US market and another one or another two more 
that are based on that, but are a little bit more adapted to what your local markets might need in certain areas. Perhaps Germany, perhaps Japan need a different, a different level of copy. And perhaps another couple of markets, perhaps Poland can go with Germany and if they have a, a similar, uh, similar needs and so on. Um, you also often find that your, your customers in the international markets are not at the same level of maturity or understanding of your product or, or technology or anything like that. So again, sometimes you might need to give a little bit of additional information that is not there in your uh, US text or in whatever your original language is. So again, how do you find the balance between um, adapting as much as you should to have maximum impact and the budget that you have and how much you can afford, um, uh, how much effort you should be putting into this. And that's where the data really comes in. So the data is gonna help you see uh, the growth potential for the markets. And uh, I mean, it's, it's whole business strategy, I suppose. It's gonna let you see as well um, for the areas where you can perhaps dab with a few of these uh, recommendations, you know, so again, if Germany is one of your main markets, perhaps try and adapt some of your materials, um, perhaps for the main funnel, the main, the main um, user journey, I suppose. Uh, adapt in there and see, measure and see how that's going. Um, and that's looking at the, the insights that the data is giving you, that will let you make better decisions regarding the, the type of um, customization that you might be perfect for you, you know, that, that might give you the best return on investment without exceeding what you can afford. You'll also be able to see what languages or what markets are not really, uh, you know, the investment is not paying off in those. So you might want to divert some resources from those and apply them in the countries where you're really seeing more growth. So this, this is all, um, I mean, it's, this, could, this could be a topic in itself. <laughs> And uh, I recently uh, had the, the opportunity to speak with Bruno Herrmann on this particular topic. So it's, uh, it's something uh, we could go on much, uh, you know, at much more length on this. But hopefully um, this, this framework, I suppose, gives you a little bit of an idea on areas that you could look at and that you could try and um, uh, include in your planning and your strategy early on uh, to, to help you reach better effectiveness for your local markets. Thank you very much, Esther. Really appreciate that. Um, and then now we are, are gonna switch over to Bruno. You mentioned Bruno, global leader in digital content product and experience effectiveness. He is definitely a global triber. He loves the global tribe and he epitomizes that by working every day across borders. If you ever end up following him in Twitter, you, you basically will be able to see some of the greatest information and content out there, not just on marketing and product management that we're talking about today, but overall, how do you become global? How do you improve your global business, et cetera? So I really enjoy your content on a daily basis, Bruno, and that you uh, both create and uh, send around. For, for our listeners uh, and watchers, uh, send in your questions now, so we'll have time at the end. Uh, Bruno and our next speaker, Christina, will be speaking about their topics and then uh, we'll have time for, for your questions. So Bruno, thank you so much for joining us today. Are you, uh, you're coming in, I believe, from uh, Brussels or Belgium, certainly, and, uh, and sharing more about the topic. Sure, thanks, Doug. Um, that's a topic actually I really love um, and I like the word effectiveness better than quality. Uh, there are many reasons for that, but one reason I really like is because effectiveness is much more driven by customers than quality. Quality, in my experience, tends to be quite company-centric and internal versus effectiveness, which is much more uh, customer-oriented. So, um, the, you know, if I had to summarize counter effectiveness, I would say in one sentence that it's all about synchronizing supply chains with experience and product value chains. And that's very important. It sounds obvious, it sounds simple, but it's not. Uh, that's essentially one of the things that have kept me, kept me busy for more than 20 years, 25 years this, this, uh, this year actually. So uh, I'd like to share some recommendations that I would make to anybody. And also one example that I think is really relevant for marketing and product management. So we can go to the next slide. 
So, uh, you know, enabling or defining content effectiveness is, first of all, scoping it. And when you ask someone or if you get the question, uh, what should you do to actually speak the language of customers, most people will tell you that you have to speak in their language with, with their words. And of course, this is linguistic effectiveness because people need really to understand content based on good quality, good effectiveness of content. Uh, but essentially, most of all in the digital age, uh, linguistic effectiveness is far from being enough. Uh, there is also cultural and functional effectiveness. And that's really what I like uh, in content effectiveness leadership is that you have to really play and deliver on the three of these topics, uh, sub facets. Sorry. So uh, it's not a matter of or, it's a matter of and. You have to really address, you have to be really effective in terms of language, culture, and functionality. And you have to develop what I call intelligence, which is uh, just like Esther said, data, insights, and, uh, and, and any type of information that can help you understand really what local customers are all about and what they, that, what they need or what they prefer. And, and that's very important because I've seen many products, many uh, applications or you know, physical products failing internationally because one of these three facets was not addressed properly. Sometimes it was perfectly in terms of language, uh, or uh, sorry, it was perfect in terms of language, but uh, essentially it was completely wrong in terms of culture. You have plenty of examples of commercials that have failed around the world. And that's really a lack, this is showing a lack of consideration and um, attention to uh, those three facets of effectiveness. Um, on the next slide, yeah, uh, I, I tend to say that um, defining uh, content effectiveness is also articulating and leveraging enablers. So uh, everyone, I think, most of all people in this, in this audience will know about the customer journey. But when you look at the international customer journey uh, from a high level perspective, because I know it can be quite complex and quite detailed, but just for the sake of this presentation, I focused on three major steps, which is reach, resonance, and reaction. You have a number of enablers and assets that you should consider if you really uh, want to expand globally. The first one is reach. How do, we, how do you reach out to these people over there? Uh, you know, what type of channel do you need to use? Uh, that requires some you know, research, some uh, testing, and, and uh, just, for, just for a few seconds, I'd like to mention that holistic testing and timely certification are really key. Um, because I know sometimes there is no time to do that or to do it properly, but as a matter of fact, the investment that you are going to make in holistic testing, so linguistic, cultural, and functional, is going to be really a time saver and a cost saver in your future uh, processes. And also timely certification. Make sure that your content, your products are certif certified to be usable in those ecosystems and in those uh, environments. So that's the, the, the very first step is to reach out to these people. When this is done, so when you've made, uh, I would say, uh, um, an impression, then you need to make an impact. And this is where resonance comes to play. You have to really walk in the shoes with your content, with your product, uh, the shoes of those local customers. And then you have a number of, again, a number of enablers and assets. Um, uh, Esther just mentioned uh, terminology. And of course, glossary of terms is certainly one of them one of the major assets you can develop, but also style guides, content repositories, uh, also uh, everything that is related to linguistic standards, which might be market related or even sub-market related, because some major countries have different linguistic standards or cultural standards, depending if you look at the, at the north, or the south, or the east, or the west. So that's, you have, to be, you have to be quite detailed to do that properly. And then if your content, if your products uh, resonate properly, effectively with local customers, this will lead actually to the last piece or the ultimate goal, as I tend to say, which is the reaction. How do you trigger reaction with your content, with your products among local customers? And this is when you are going to make an imprint. So you leave the, the impact zone and you move to the imprint zone, because if you do that properly, your customers will remember your content, they will remember your products, and they will come back which is most of all in the digital world, it's certainly a, a huge uh, benefit and a huge asset for your business. 
Uh, and again, here there are some, some enablers that you should really focus on, like the commercial and legal frameworks, uh, the transactional protocols, how do people pay in some countries, uh, what type of um, tran transaction do they like, etc. So all that, whether it's to purchase something or to provide with, ass with assistance, it has to be properly and, and I would say uh, managed from a user-centric perspective and make sure that uh, when there is an action, again, when it can, can be a purchase or it can be just a request for assistance, when this request is made that the reaction uh, goes as smoothly as possible. And that's what I call end-to-end effectiveness. So this is one of my recommendations to articulate it. Then uh, the example I would like to mention is, and this is, this is coming up more and more frequently in the marketing and sales environments, is to address motion and emotion. Uh, I still hear today people talk about customers uh, when somebody comes from, from, for the first time to their website. And I tell them, are you sure this is a customer? Because it's just a visitor. I mean, look at it, look at him. He's just looking for information. He's, he hasn't purchased anything. For me, a customer is someone who is purchasing something, a service or a product. So that's why I like to kind of recommend in the chain of the value chain of experience to look at each and every step of international customers. From the moment they look for something, when they search for information, when they struggle, when they compare your products with other ones, until the moment they purchase your products or your services. And these are micro experiences that, I, that have to be really addressed by effective content. And I use the word, which is, I know, a little bit strange uh, in a very, I would say, um, uh, digital space, which is snackable content. Well, snackable content is exactly how people should, specifically marketing and, and uh, product managers, uh, should really consider creating their products now. It has to be snackable, it has to be agile. I like snackable because, like a snack, it has to be something that the customer wants to use anywhere, anytime, when he wants it. It's like a snack. You take a snack in your pocket, and you want to eat it wherever you are, when you want it, uh, and how you want it. And that's what's, what I would say content effectiveness in marketing and, and sales management has to be right now. Uh, I know there are still some practices to create big bunches of content just to focus on, on the purchase uh, objective, which is, of course, a legitimate objective. But at the end of the day, there are a number of steps before that. And if you don't consider, specifically some, in some cultures, in some countries, it's really critical to address, for instance, the compare step. When a, a person has just one click to make to go to your competitor. And it means that your content has to be, again, linguistically, culturally, and functionally uh, clean, absolutely clean and actionable. Otherwise, your customer will click and go to uh, one or multiple other websites. So that is, that is definitely something to, to create. <laughs> and when, when I talk about creating snackable content, this is what I would strongly recommend. Making it topical, actionable, audiovisual, and audio, I, I just added audio uh, these days because we are in a world of device first, uh, sorry, voice first devices. And this is very important because of course, you know, visual content is still speaking louder and hitting faster than words, but audio is as well. So audiovisual is now uh, the name of the game. Portable, shareable, memorable, contextual, and modular. If you focus on these KPIs, if you want to call it that way, or if you just focus on, on these uh, effectiveness criteria, as I prefer to call them, uh, you will actually be on the right track to actually deliver uh, what's going to be convenient, authentic, and sticky for international customers. But always, Keep in mind that it has to be linguistically, culturally, and functionally uh, effective. You cannot ignore just the functional part of that, uh, otherwise you will fail uh, in a number of markets. So we can go to the next slide, which leads me to also tell you that uh, defining and enabling uh, global content effectiveness is all about raising the convenience bar. Esther touched, touched on localization. And localization is a key part of that. But the question comes up quite regularly, 
uh, in business meetings or in customer meetings, you know, how far should we go? Should we go to customized content or should we go, or should we simply use leveraged content? And I know it, it's a, quite a, um, a tricky and painful question, not only from a funding and, and financial perspective, but also from an experience perspective. Because in any case, if you consider leveraging content across multiple markets, just because it's in English, and you say, well, it's for the UK, South Africa, and Singapore, yes, maybe linguistically it might be so-so, but culturally, believe me, culturally speaking, there are big differences between the UK, South Africa, and Singapore. So leveraging content is still a possibility, but I would use it very, very carefully and certainly uh, not uh, for all audiences. But then comes, the, comes the, 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 the point about translated content. Do we, do, we need to make it, do we need to make it linguistically effective only? So that, for instance, you know, it, it has to be translated from English to Spanish, considering that all Spanish-speaking people will like it. Knowing the differences between people in Spain and Colombia and Chile, forget about it. Translated content will have to be, again, used very carefully for maybe some sorts of general content, very general content. But the key, the key areas that have to be focused on are really localized content and customized content. So localized content, as Esther mentioned, this is where actually you really combine, you, you create a winning combination between your linguistic effectiveness, your cultural effectiveness, and your functional effectiveness. This is some sort of sweet spot, if you will. It's a sweet spot, it's a sweet spot also because the next step, which is customized content, which is uh, a few steps further, is probably what every customer would like in an ideal world, but then comes the question, you know, should we balance the cost of customizing with the cost of localizing? Is it really worth customizing if localizing is going to delight customers anyway? So this is more a matter of balancing costs, risks, and uh, dependencies uh, between customization and localization. But certainly I would really focus in, in terms of effectiveness or from, a, from an effectiveness perspective, I would definitely focus on those uh, two areas, but I still mentioned the two other ones simply because I know people still love to talk about translated content and leveraged content, but uh, I always uh, raise the red flag and say, hey, uh, don't forget that this, is, this might be good for you, but not for your audience. And I think with that, that's all uh, I wanted to briefly <laughs> focus on today. So um, back to you, Doug. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, our, our next and last speaker is Christina Podner. She's a principal at Native Trust Consulting. Uh, Christina, you've got some really extraordinary background on the marketing side and the product development side, and you're gonna be sharing more on this topic. Uh, and when you're finished, we'll be also speaking uh, and, and addressing any questions. We are gonna end though at the top of the hour, so uh, keep that in mind uh, with, uh, with your presentation. And if you're, um, as you're watching, the, the, those of you who are watching and listening, uh, get your questions in and we'll address those at the end of Christina's uh, section. So Christina, thank you for your time. You're, uh, I believe in the US, somewhere near in the, in the Southern US and probably a little bit warm today. So actually right outside of Washington DC and it is in fact a little bit warm cooling down for us a little bit tonight, I think. So we're, we're in good shape, not as hot as everybody else's. Fantastic. But, Thanks for sharing your uh, information today. Oh, you know, I was so delighted when Bruno suggested uh, that we all come together for a session. You have no idea. I mean, it's very much a privilege for me, so I appreciate it. And as Esther and Bruno have been talking, you know, you can't tell by my heart's going pitter-patter because in my mind, digital is all about the balance of opportunity and risk. And so both Esther and Bruno were talking about things like language and content and functionality and the ability to take our content and digital channels um, globally, if you will, and really internationalize content in an effective way. 
But what we forget sometimes, um, and Esther pointed back out to, um, to us, is that sometimes when we do tend to go from a domestic market to a global market, there are certain things we simply don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And those things that you don't know are the things that actually get you into trouble. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that today and the power of digital policy and how that can actually help you out to ensure that you take advantage of everything that digital has to offer us in the marketing and the product space, but that you also sidestep any of the minefield um, aspects that are out there and that can pose risk to you and to your organization. So if we head on to the next slide, um, you know, one of the things that often pops to my mind when we talk about the digital space, whether it's a specific marketing campaign or it's perhaps a uh, product launch, you know, some kind of service that we're rolling out, I really think back to a quote by uh, James Soretsky. He once said that homogeneous groups are great at doing what they do well, but they become progressively less able to investigate alternatives. And to me, that sort of is true a lot of where we are in the digital space sometimes, right? Either as content uh, developers, as marketers, as designers, as developers, project managers, testers, analysts, whoever you are, you know, we're really great at doing what we know how to do. And we're really great at putting our heads down and working on a website, or maybe it's another digital product. And we get all of this knowledge and all of ourselves invested in it, which is great. That's what we want. And we get the product or campaign as near perfect shape as possible. But what we fail to do really is to take a step back and kind of take a look at the, you know, beyond the details, beyond the fonts and the colors, uh, maybe the written word um, or how that written word translates. What we forget to do is take a look at the bigger picture and try and understand what are the risks? What are the things that could potentially go wrong? Or where are the uncaptured opportunities, if you will? And it's really at that sort of sweet center spot of all of those risks and opportunities that we find digital policies. Right? When we do kind of put our focus on digital products, whether it's the website or the customized portals or the social media channels, mobile applications, AI, whatever you're working on, right? We become that homogeneous group that risk we wrote about and the greater digital integrity can be placed at risk right? Effectiveness kind of goes out the window and there's nobody paying attention to this alternative. And before you know it, it's really easy to get stuck in poor user experiences, um, issues that place the brand at risk, things like a lawsuit maybe in the face of accessibility or data privacy issues because you're in a market that doesn't have the same regulatory or legal bounds as your market does. Or maybe, you know, you're getting even ready to go through due diligence because of your company is getting bought out and so you have to merge multiple markets together and you have to have integrity in digital. And so, you know, it's really hard to sort of see the forest for the trees sometimes, but the antidote to those things um, that can go wrong when you make up the rules as you go really are those digital policies. And so digital policies, even though they might sound boring, some people kind of look at me and, and say that their eyes are starting to close, but even though they sound kind of boring, they're really helpful because they're guardrails that you know, not necessarily a rule book, but they're more like guardrails. They are the things that can keep you safe, but can kind of make sure that you can speed down that highway because you know where the rails are and kind of where you have to slow down so you don't go over the uh, edge and into the ravine. And so those guardrails can really ensure that your business's online activity gets done in the right way and in the right channel and in the right delivery mechanism, in the right language at the right time and the right functionality as Bruno mentioned. And so, Effective digital policies is something that we should all have. Very few organizations tend to have them today and very few organizations have them collectively for all of the things that, you know, that we ought to have in the digital space. In fact, it's always surprising to me that we still live in an era where if you're out of the office for more than three days, you might have to bring a doctor's note. So we have a policy in the organization that says you bring in a doctor's note. But what we tend to not have are these effective digital policies that are simple, clear statements on how your business will conduct its digital operations um, that provide a level of detail that translate the digital strategy into actions, especially for different markets in different locales with different cultures and different norms, and really kind of help take the business's culture and the beliefs and the goals and the objectives and translate them both sort of into that international and local markets that Esther and Bruno talked about and do it in a way that provides a necessary guidance and supports all digital workers, you know, whether they're employees or vendors or contractors. So 
you know, if you're just kind of starting out in the digital space, kind of thinking about going international, like Esther said, or if you're a large multinational that's sort of flying by the seat of its pants, this is an excellent time to revisit your digital policies and say, ought we to have some of these? And what are the guardrails that we need in order to balance out the risk and the opportunities that digital brings to us? And so if we head on to the next slide, um, you know, what I want to talk about is, you know, what does it really take to have good digital policies? So a lot of people say to me, gosh, Christina, sounds like Nirvana with digital policies, but what does that really look like in an organization? How do you actually get that done? And so it really comes down to having two roles defined within an organization to make digital policies effective, get digital policy right online, and ensure that you have that proper balance between the risk and the opportunities. And so I define those things as a digital policy steward and digital policy author. In many organizations, there are multiple digital policy authors, and I'll touch upon that in a few minutes. But to address briefly the, the role of the digital policy steward, this is an individual that is delegated most of the nitty, you know, gritty work um, of kind of paying attention to the global scheme of digital. They're almost like the librarian, right? If you think of a traditional librarian, when you walk into a library, the librarian has organized all of the books in the library. They've ordered the material they believe is necessary for the audience and the clientele that come in to the library. So they know exactly the likes, the interests, okay. the geography, uh, cultural norms, language, et cetera. They've organized those books in a way that users can understand them. And they've actually made sure that everything is balanced out in terms of having the same format for finding books, whether they're organized by alphabetical order of the uh, author, or perhaps they're using the librarian duty decimal system, et cetera. But the librarian's job is to organize the whole library. And it's the same thing in our digital space. The digital policy steward is really in charge of organizing all of the digital policies, the digital, I don't want to call them guidelines, um, you know, Esther mentioned guidelines, but to me, guidelines tend to be very optional. I think they're very appropriate. But policies at the end of the day and, and are sort of the rules, they're the things that we don't want to break because they are the things that, like Esther said, you know, we'll end up with a bad commercial in a specific market. Or like Bruno said, it's not going to be an effective delivery of your content. And so, you know, that digital steward is really in, in charge of ensuring that we have those rules, those guardrails to keep you safe, keep you functioning in the digital space, but allow creativity and allow freedom and allow innovation, especially in the local market, so you can get your job of business done, whatever that is. And so, in a smaller organization, when you're just kind of getting started, the steward might actually be focused on putting out fires, but as the organization starts to mature in digital practices, the focus really shifts to preventing fires. And so the type of activities that we oftentimes find uh, stewards involved in are things like monitoring the sources of relevant information for digital news. Things like keeping you know, the ear to the ground and uh, thinking about trends and best practices, uh, like Bruno mentioned, like the laws or the regulations in a specific market. Things that are happening that positively or negatively impact how we work in the digital space and ensuring that those things actually get to be translated into not just, hey, here's what's happening in the digital space, but here's what we as an organization ought to do about something that's happening in the digital space. Um, for example, if you have a competitor who is going through a lot of data breaches at this moment, the question uh, might be, you know, what ought we to do? Well, perhaps we should be a little bit safer than our competitor because it's a competitive advantage and we can get um, kind of ahead of them, if you will, in keeping integrity in our own space. And so Digital Steward is really organizing the central repository of policies and guidance, really working with the digital policy authors who are nothing more, and I don't mean that in a condescending way, they're nothing more than, um, they are a lot more, but they're nothing more really than subject matter experts who can formulate the organization's perspective on a specific topic. Right, so if it's accessibility, if it's localization or translation, whatever it is, that policy author can actually work with a policy steward to say, here's what our organization ought to do in order to keep us out of trouble, but really leverage and exploit digital for all it's worth. So those two individuals or roles, and there could be multiple authors in the organization, but those two roles work together. And really, it's their core responsibility to ensure that the organization has the policies that we need. And, you know, just 
kind of like preventative health care, right? The policies enable the good digital health by offsetting the most common legal risks and lawsuits, inaccessible websites, et cetera, and make sure that also the organization can respond to really the opportunities. So these two individuals might be doing things like looking at accessibility, cookies um, for tracking devices, uh, copyrights, data breach, SEO, data privacy, kind of a core set of things. And what you're seeing on your screen is the core set of things that we look to have in terms of digital policies documented for organizations that are starting out in the digital space, okay? In larger organizations, we're going to see a vaster list. Um, if you're maybe a startup in three people, it's gonna be a shorter list. This is more of a middle of the road. And the goal is really to have those two individuals gather the information for the policies, document them, get approval, measure and maintain the policies to ensure that when they're no longer needed, they get retired, or we update them for effectiveness, budgetary responses, et cetera. And then also create a repository. So this is a really great place for anybody in a specific market to go to and get information on what is it that I ought to do around my marketing campaign? What I should I do or ought to I do around a specific product or a specific service? So I don't create a disaster internationally and I do have effective content, but at the same token, I'm leveraging all that I can um, that digital can bring to the organization. So you know, my experience, small, large, whatever size you are, you need digital policies and you need them to do exactly what Esther and Bruno have been talking about, which is enable the organization and, to, and really to enable individual content creators to be effective in, in the content realm. Fantastic. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, uh, Bruno and Esther, also for your uh, uh, contributions. We now have some time for questions, and I'd like to kind of build off uh, with the first question, uh, kind of a two-parter um, from different ones coming in. Um, the uh, digital steward that you mentioned, Christina, you mentioned it as a person or as a role. I guess I had imagined it for like certainly many of our members, that would likely be a role. For, for someone uh, who typically does that in, in the organization? How does that play out? Well, you know, it's not a typical scenario, fortunately or unfortunately. I think it's mostly because we're so immature still in the digital space. If you are in a larger organization, it's very likely, like a multinational, it's likely that you already have legal or compliance that's playing this type of a role. The challenge there is that legal or compliance isn't versed in content. They don't know digital very well. And so, that's where they, is their downfall. And so what we really need to do is either kind of get them educated or get them partnered with somebody who understands digital so they can really do the job of stewardship well. But optimally, you know, that'll sort of get there one day. In the meantime, I find that uh, digital marketing or even digital IT can also steward well. So you're looking for somebody that has a specific uh, kind of set of capabilities and that can reside any place in the organization and you want to house it where it's most appropriate to your organization but there's not a norm okay the second part of that goes back to something bruno said he said something like it's not a matter of or it's a matter of and which kind of and then in a lot of things that you guys have talked about i think probably you see it probably more than than i but i'm guessing that a lot of people you uh, work with may not be thinking about all of these things. It's, it's a matter of resources and not every company has all of these resources. There has to be some risk. When you're, when you're with a big company, it's, you, know, you can't make any mistake. And so the bureaucracy related to that means it takes a lot of time to do a lot of things. And if you're just an early startup, you're just winging it and you're making errors at the same time you're doing good stuff. So how do you each balance that you know, error versus uh, good stuff, uh, given that probably any organization you're working with and certainly all of our members, you know, don't have unlimited resources. How do you make that balance? Well, from my perspective, it's a very simple balance in terms of risk and opportunity. Um, and it's not about the size of the organization as it is your tolerance for business risk. You know, you can have a very large, very well-established multinational that's looking to be highly competitive and more relevant in the international market, for example, and they're going to aggressively go out there and exploit digital for all that it's worth, they might choose to be more 
you know, risk tolerant, if you will, and to really seize the opportunity of digital. Or you can have a small company that's looking to get acquired and conversely is more risk averse. So it's about where you are in sort of that risk tolerance journey rather than the size that you are. But either way, you know, this can be something like a 5% job for somebody who's in a small organization all the way to a half-time or full-time role in a large multinational. I think the key there, though, is to really flip, if you will, digital risk and opportunities on its head and look at policies as opportunities. So if we know continuously what content approval mechanisms we have to go through, what is the uh, sort of checklist that we have to do to get a good set of content out the door, people can be faster, they can be more creative, and they can be more innovative without that risk. And so to me, policies are about enablers for the organization, whether you're small or large, rather than things that are construct constraining or they're bureaucratic in nature. And I don't know, Esther and Bruno probably have a, a sense of that as well uh, from their experience. Fantastic. Esther, Bruno, what do you think? Esther? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I agree with uh, with Christina totally. Uh, it is a matter of um, of uh, opportunity and uh, and risk. Um, again, my advice for anyone who feels they don't have the budgets necessary to do this uh, this kind of thing. I mean, very few organizations do it in a full blown manner. You know, across all of their international markets. Again, I would look at which ones you feel are critical to your success, and perhaps start very small with perhaps just one of your um, one of your international markets that you feel is really going to make a difference and make little changes there. Look at the user journey, make a few changes in there and check how that's progressing. Um, if you have a few wins there that can give you the additional, um, the additional budget, I suppose, you know, the, you might see the, the additional growth coming in and you can continue investing and expanding. What I would add, from a more operational perspective is that uh, I would recommend any organization to focus a lot when it's about operations on alignment and collaboration. Because I believe that uh, th th there are many pitfalls there. Uh, I can give you one example that I've seen many, many times in different companies, in different industries. You have a great digital product, a platform or an application, and you ask your IT team, your developers to test it, to certify it. And you say, yes, they will do it perfectly, but they will focus on the functional, the functional effectiveness of it. They will fix a number of bugs, but by fixing those bugs, actually they will create cultural or linguistic bugs. So actually, if you don't align this group testing with marketing testing, with other groups, legal testing as well, you will end up with one group testing and certifying your product from their perspective, which is all natural. There is no, nobody to blame for that but you will actually lose the end that I just mentioned, which is that by, by solving a number of functional issues, you will actually create, or you may create, a number of linguistic and cultural issues. And still, in the process, you might see, yes, there is a flag called certified, but no, it will be certified functionally, but not linguistically and culturally. And that's why you need a lot of collaboration, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of alignment and just about the mindset that Esther mentioned several times, I think it's key as well. Uh, and this is probably a little bit away from operations here. It's probably about philosophy and, uh, you know, awareness and, well, Esther did that perfectly, so I'm not going to repeat that. But I think one, one, one sort of sentence that I tend to tell any organization is that focus on your products, digitally speaking at least, focus on your products to actually be effective and delight customers. That is your purpose. The result will be selling and making money. <laughs> so don't confuse and don't say that your, your objective is making, making money and selling. Make the purpose before the result. Because for me, at least in my long experience, there is no result without purpose. And the purpose is delighting customers and creating uh, effective, uh, effective products. Okay, very good, Thank you, Bruno. Uh, we have time for one more question, and it's somewhat related um, in the sense of delighting uh, and also uh, making sure that uh, issues and risks are managed. What tools uh, are um, in localization and translation are becoming available now uh, for companies that um, 
both may have the a full budget and those that might have a skinny budget. Are there tools for that that are coming out right now or that you're expecting to come out in the next couple of years that companies should keep their eyes out for to, to make this process easier, quote unquote, uh, and more effective? You wanna take that, Bruno, or will I? Uh, <laughs> it's such a huge question. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's, it's, too, it's so huge. Yeah, I, I, I would say one thing, and then I can I can just finish, Esther. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to spend time on you know listing platforms and tools now. If somebody's interested, I can I can do that offline for sure or online. <laughs> um, but I would say focus a lot on tools and platforms for translation localization management that will be based on intelligent automation. Not specifically AI, because all tools and platforms will be AI driven, if not today, tomorrow. So it's more, more important when you are going to choose a tool uh, to actually look at what this tool does in terms of automation, and if it does it in an intelligent way, so that you don't have actually to wonder if automation, if it's, if, it's going to, if it's going to be automated enough or if it's going to fit into your, into your business model. But I have plenty of references and names, but Esther, <laughs> I'll let you finish this point because it's too big for me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very vibrant space. Like the, um, the technology landscape, I suppose, in localization, it's evolving very, very rapidly. Um, it's at integrations at the moment. It's a... Uh, most of the main tools are now integrating with the main marketing technology um, tools and the, uh, most of the platforms you might use for hosting your web and so on. So you want to make sure that that is there. Now, one thing I have to say is um, you don't necessarily have to invest. Uh, and there's also the, the, there's very wide differences between pricing as well. You don't always have to invest in one of these yourself. You might be able to do it through your localization vendors. Um, I would advise caution here because they might be trying to steer you towards the ones they, you know, they might have partnerships themselves. So the resource might not always be entirely for your benefit. Uh, but again, this is where I would make sure that uh, anyone internally who is using <laughs> automation that might, uh, where you might need to extract text from it for localization, get their input on, on what's needed and make sure that the tool you're using is going to integrate seamlessly with it. Because otherwise you, you end up with a lot of cutting and pasting, uh, very manual processes, very error-prone processes, and so on. Yeah, that's a topic for a full webinar, uh, Doug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. Well, uh, thank you, um, all three of you, for your time. There are some additional questions, so we'll handle those offline. We'll typically send out a blog post in about a week with uh, additional content and answering any additional questions. And so those of you who have additional questions, in addition to what you've already asked, send them to info at globalchamber.org and we'll be able to process them. Contact any of our speakers, of course, uh, and if you have trouble, also send the email at globalchamber.org and we'll be happy to connect you. Global Chamber is growing out in 525 metro areas around the world, which basically is everywhere. And that's the intent is to have a chamber of commerce that you can join for people who are growing across metro areas and across borders. Um, as all three of our speakers here uh, today, you can tell that they're global people. Uh, and, and you probably watching are also global. So we encourage you to get involved in one way or another. We do events and we also do Globinars, typically one or, once or twice a week. I know one of the ones that we have coming up is the IE Business School out of Madrid is going to be talking about some of the international education opportunities that they have both in Spain, across Europe, and across the world. Um, and so check out our Globinars by going to globalchamber.org slash events, and uh, we'll have both our events and also other global events that may be of interest to you. Again, thank you. To you, uh, Bruno, for pulling these ladies, really smart ladies together, Esther and Christina, thank you for your time today, and we thank you all for watching. Take care and have a great day or evening. Thank Bye you. Everybody.